and welcome to episode 33 of Board Game Blitz, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network and a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to figure out how to send a bug report to an app developer. This week, we're entering The Grid, a digital frontier, to talk about the digital side of board games. First, we discuss a few games we've played recently, like Vinhos, Unearth, and Future Tense. Then, we talk about how technology has invaded board games with app-assisted games and app implementations of games. Finally, we wrap things up with a look at the etymology of the word play. And now, here are your hosts. Ambie, Cassidy, and me, Crystal. I finally got to play Vinhos the other day. I've had Vinhos for over a year. <laughs> I bought it with CO2. Vinhos and CO2 are both games by Vital Lacerda, and he makes thematic Euro games. But I had them for over a year, and I finally got to play Vinhos. <laughs> it was really fun. So Vinhos is a game where you're making wine. You're making wine vineyards and showing off your wine at trade fairs. So you have a worker that moves around different action spaces, and you can do the different actions. But if another player is already there, you have to pay them money to do the action. There's six years in the game, and you do two actions per year. So there's only 12 actions in the game, which which was sad because there's so much I wanted to do, but the game went by so fast and then there wasn't enough time to do everything. But it was also pretty neat and thematic. Like when you build vineyards, they produce wine and then at the end of each year, the wine ages and that can make it more valuable, but only if you have a cellar to store the wine in. And that obviously takes an action to get, so that takes up one of your 12 actions. But if you have played any other Vital Lacerda games like Kanban or The Gallerist, or CO2, you might know that there are a lot of steps you need to do in order to make make your thing that you want to make. So Vinhos is typical. You There's a lot of steps you need to do to make valuable wine. So I really like that. I like planning ahead and being able to do a bunch of steps. And a lot of the steps make sense too. And another cool thing about the game is that each year there's this weather tile that changes and that affects how your wine is produced. So if it's a bad year, everyone's wine ends up worse because of that. So it's like, oh, you know, that year 1980 or whatever, that was not a good year or something. <laughs> I don't drink wine, so I, but I hear people talk about that when they talk about wine. So in my game, I played two player with Toby. Our first four years were bad years, so it was really hard for us to get good wine. So both of us didn't have that much money and didn't have that much wine. But then later on, it was good years. It's like, oh, this is how you make wine now. <laughs> so in Vinos, one of the main ways to get points is the trade fair. You get points for having different features in your wine, like taste or aroma. And it's cool because there's a special track for the trade fair, and your points there don't reset. Since if you're famous in one year, then the next year people are also looking forward to it, and you already have that reputation. So you want to get higher on the track than other players because you want to be more famous than them. And there's a lot of other interesting things to the game, like when you enter the trade fair, you also develop a relationship with these managers, and later on in the game, you can give them wine, and then they do bonus actions for you, because you give them your wine. <laughs> so there's a lot of different actions, and it felt really thematic. And even though I don't like wine, I kind of wish I did, because I really like Green <laughs> House, and it seems like it would be a good game to play while drinking wine. <laughs> It would Plus be a good game to play party. while drinking wine. <laughs> yeah, There's no cheese in it, though. No cheese. That's lame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does sound like it plays like a uh, gallerist quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Now I want cheese, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Last episode, I mentioned how much I enjoyed Unearth after demoing it at Origins. So as promised, I will be talking about it as my recently played, even though it was about a month ago now, but... That's okay. It's recent enough. <laughs> First, you will be able to pick up Unearth at Gen Con this year. That's when it's releasing. It will play two to four players in roughly 25 to 50 minutes, and the time frame is definitely dependent on number of players. And this is brought to you by Brotherwise Games of Boss Monster fame. In Unearth, you're using dice as workers to compete against other players to reclaim lost ruins and build wonders. I fell in love with the aesthetic of this game because it reminded me of one of my favorite mobile app games, which is Monument Valley. I really like the colors in that mobile game, and this one has the same sort of color scheme, and it's just very pretty to look at. I hate saying pretty to look at, but it's pretty to look at. In Unearth, each player will start with two dollar cards, which allow you to manipulate your die rolls. 
and you get a secret ruin card. So you know what it is. Nobody else knows what it is. Each turn, you'll be attempting to collect additional ruin cards and stones off of the ruins to create wonders. You do this by rolling your dice workers. So you're going to declare which ruin card you want, and each card has a color and a number. So you are trying to collect sets of cards. You're going to look at which cards you are trying to collect and kind of try to get the same color. And the number on the card is how many is the dice total on that card. So whoever has the most, they're the highest value of dice on the card gets it. So dice just keep collecting on the card until the number on it has been reached from everyone's dice, not just yours. So if I put like a, it's a 10 point card and I put a five down and Ambie put a four and a two down, then she would have six on the card and would get it because we're over the 10 total, but she had the highest value on it. If you roll a one, two or three, you get a stone off of a card and you still get to put your dice on it. And the stones are what you use to build your monuments. And there's a set of monuments that are out to play or to collect. And each one has a different order of colored stone that you need to build to actually get the the wonder. I said monuments because, again, it looks so much like Monument Valley that I mix them up. So anyway, wonders. At the end of the game, you score points based on your sets of ruin cards you've collected, the wonders you've built, and if you have built more than three, or if you've built three or more wonders, you get extra points. And if you've collected all five colors of ruin cards, you get extra points. I really, really liked this game. I pre-ordered it almost as soon as I played it because it was just, I loved it. It was fun. And that's Unearth. It comes out of Gen Con. I will admit that sounds pretty interesting. And I am not the biggest fan of Boss Monster, I had high expectations for that game because I loved the 8-bit art. And so when you said that this is by the same company, I was kind of like, oh, a little cringe. <laughs> but that actually sounds pretty interesting. It's nothing like Boss Monster. I li- I actually enjoy Boss Monster. We we have it and we have all the expansions and stuff. But I think I like Boss Monster for nostalgic reasons. <laughs> Not necessarily for gameplay reasons. Okay. And, and Unearth, where it's a dice game and... I instantly should hate it because dice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the other thing is that the dice are different. You have three six-sided, a four-sided, and an eight-sided. So mm-hmm. if you really want a stone off of a specific card, you're probably going to roll a four-sided die so you have a better chance of getting a one, two, or three. And so you sort of have to – there's a lot of strategy in in what dice you use and in which cards you go for based on what you're trying to accomplish in the game. It was a – it was easy to learn, but it was a lot deeper than I had expected it to be. Very cool. I think you're starting to like dice games. Um, yes. I'm blaming <laughs> some people in yeah! my game club. No, because... I'm taking responsibility for at least part of this. <laughs> oh, that would be because of Sagrada, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but... One of the guys in my game club, he and he listens, and he every time I mention anything that he's made me play in a game, he's like, ha, 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 ha. I'm like, whatever. Whatever, Corey. Whatever. <laughs> so he makes me play dice games a lot, and they're not typical. So I play, like, Kingsburg mm-hmm. and Castles of Burgundy and dice games that where they're easy to manipulate the dice or you have multiple options and you're not just tied to this one thing to do with it. Mm-hmm. And I think that has a lot to do with why I'm enjoying more dice games. But I still... Do not like a lot of dice games. <laughs> Speaking of Sagrada, I we got to meet Daryl Andrews, the designer of Sagrada at Dice Tower Con, and he is also, like everyone else we mentioned in the previous episode, also a lovely human. And I was very happy to meet him because I like his game so much. And it took a lot for me to not like fangirl out about how much I love Sagrada when I met him. And I think I restrained myself appropriately. I didn't say anything because, you know, yeah. <laughs> So for my recently played, I'm actually going to go back to Dice Tower Con and mention something big that I didn't talk about in our last episode. And Ambie will be able to chime in on this as well, uh, because she and I both participated in our first mega game at Dice Tower Con. For those of you who aren't familiar with mega games, it's kind of hard to explain 
The easiest way to describe a mega game in general is that it is a large scale game for anywhere from often like 20 to like, I think 80 or 100 people, maybe some of them go up to. And it combines elements of board gaming and RPGs and just role playing in general. There isn't really anything LARP related, but I think they theoretically could if you wanted to. But it um, combines elements of all those things into a big scale game that can last anywhere from like two to like eight hours. The one we played was called Future Tense. And we had eight teams of between like five and six people. Although one of the teams I think wasn't really participating that much. So it was more like seven teams. So we had like probably around 40 or 45 people participating in the game. And in the game, we were told by the control team, who is the people are the people running the game, that these aliens have kind of shown up on Earth and that these big towers have appeared and that they're spitting out CO2 emissions and that the whole world's going to die from the rising CO2 levels if we don't do something about it. And that's kind of all we were told early on. And then as the rounds went on, we were given more and more information about what was happening. But what's neat about the game is each team has to assign someone to a different room during the play phase. And the different rooms all were kind of their own mini games. So there was the map room, which was an area control game where you were actually manipulating the pieces on the map. There was the casino where people were playing a version of Blind Man's Bluff to try and get uh, resources and things. There was the conference, which I think is the one I was in, which is basically an I split you choose game to get control of resources. There was the high table, which is that that, Ambie, I believe that's the one that you were in for your team. Yeah, I was in that one. Where they were kind of playing a... Uh, similar to like Battlestar Galactica's, uh, you have to assign resources to a crisis mm-hmm. type thing, but there were bonuses if you assigned the most and the thing failed, or if you assigned nothing and it passed. So there were like yeah, a lot of points. <laughs> very meta. And then there was um, the exchange, and I can't remember the specific game type that that one was based on. I know that the, my, the person on my team who went to that was like, okay, I can buy us exactly what I need if we have three of this thing. And so I was like, here's three of that thing. Go do whatever that you're doing. <laughs> Sounds like it was a trade room then, basically. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. But I think there might have been more to it, but it's, it's hard to know. Cause, and you can, during the course of the game, switch rooms if you want, but that's not very beneficial to do because we were kind of forming alliances within our own mm-hmm. individual rooms. And... This game was my jam. I would. I want to hear Ambie's thoughts on it in a second because I know Ambie's a little more introverted than I am, and I'm fairly extroverted. And I was like, I was literally like working the other teams from round one. I had so much fun manipulating other people and other like, and not always in bad ways, sometimes in good ways too. But like in our very first round in my room, um, the people who were assigning the order for the I split you choose were kind of chosen randomly. And uh, one of the girls in my group who got picked put me ahead of some of the other guys just by random chance. And I, the first thing I did as soon as we picked our resources is I walked over to her and I, and I handed her a card, like a, one of the resources that I had gained. And I said, I just wanted to say thank you for putting me ahead of the other people. And I hope that we can work together in the future. And she was like, oh, that's really nice. Like she hadn't asked for anything from me, but you could do whatever you wanted within the confines of the game. You could just give people resources or you could negotiate things and you could stab people in the back and... Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. And uh, my team won at the very end, which was very awesome. We had the most victory points and CO2 levels did not rise so much that the world died. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was the main win. (laughs) But yeah, I I thought it was really fun too. Uh, And also interesting because there's the controllers and they know the whole game and are like running it, but you can go up to them and talk to them and do different things too, because it's more like a role-playing game. So our team ended up like going to them and trading with them kind of. Yeah, they were like doing secret (laughs) sneaky stuff that they- did a black market, (laughs) which is crazy. (laughs) But we got in trouble for it. (laughs) But yeah, that, that was pretty funny. But yeah, like most of the game, I didn't know what was going on. And I wasn't even paying attention to the points. At midway through the game, we our team was in first. I'm like, how are we in first? <laughs> like, what? 
what what did we do? <laughs> I think that was the only round that my team wasn't in first because we were in first okay. for most of the game, <laughs> and nobody was coming after us, which was crazy. We yeah. were like, ha- like, because I think we- most people didn't care as much about the points as the overall story. Yeah, like they wanted to make sure the aliens don't kill us, stuff like that. So it, it was very role play type game, I think. Very much so. And so I don't, I mean, Ambie, you're an introvert. Would you say that introverted people could enjoy an experience like this? But or, or do they need to be a little willing to kind of step out of their comfort zone to some degree to get the full experience? Uh, yeah, well, you need to talk to people to get the full experience. It's a little hard to get information from everyone. So as an introvert, like I had a tougher time talking to people, but then some people came up to me and we had like, we got to talk a little bit, but uh, it's very hectic. So, yeah, that's, and uh, they don't give you a lot of information in the beginning. So it is kind of fly yeah. by the seat of your pants. And so that's why mm-hmm. I was immediately like, I just want to make some alliances early on because I don't want other people to be making alliances behind my back. So I would rather just make yeah. them... I mean, we, and, and, I made some alliances too, but it ended up with the wrong team. Oh no! <laughs> Z, and we made Garcia. Oh yeah, his team, wah, his, team wah, was, wah. his team was the evil team. <laughs> and I not surprised. Him, but <laughs> yeah, their their team was basically the traitor team that was supposed to like <laughs> s- screw everything up at the end, and luckily they did not fail. Or that luckily they did fail <laughs> they in did screwing fail. everything up. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. But I, there are a bunch of different mega games, and they ran two sessions of Future Tense, a session of The World Turned Upside Down, which is an American Revolutionary War uh, scenario, and then they ran a Watch the Skies, which is the most well known of all the mega games. Watch the Skies, I know, is ta- I know, it takes between uh, six and eight hours to play. Future Tense, the one we did, only took three hours exactly, and it honestly felt like a much bigger experience than you could expect to get in a three. Like I've played board games that took much longer than three hours. And this was fast paced and interesting and engaging the whole way through. Like there was very little time within that three hours that I felt like there was any downtime at all. Like there were like planning phases where we kind of were like, okay, we've got our stuff worked out and we're just waiting for the next phase, but barely at all. So I would say if you want to try a mega game and maybe watch the skies is a little too intimidating because it's such a long experience, I would say definitely Future Tense is great. The organization that ran it at Dice Tower Con, I believe they're based out of New York, um, and it's called Liveware Lab, L-I-V-E-W-A-R-E Lab, L-A-B, and... They, the I spoke with some of the people after the fact, and they will come and run events at other places. Uh, I do not know how much they charge. They will, you can request quotes on their website, but honestly, I don't know if they'll fly to Vegas, but I truthfully would love to host a mega game event in Vegas. And if they are willing to come out and do it, I don't know how much that would cost, probably a lot, but I think it would be a lot of fun. So if you're on the West Coast and you know of any mega games happening in a place that I could get to easily, let me know because <laughs> I want to go do more of them. So for our thematic segment this week, we are talking about board games that have gone digital. We're meaning that in that games that have an app companion that is utilized while you're playing the board game or app versions of existing board games. I play a lot of digital games. (laughs) I think I'm up to 20 now on my tablet. Yeah, that's it's a nice filler for lunch hours. I don't like to take my games into work because people look at me like I'm a crazy person. So instead, I just play games on my tablet, and that seems to do the trick. Hmm. I think some of my favorites are... I know I've talked about Kingdom Builder before, and I love their their app version, and Takedo is a beautiful app. So do, I know that... The Kingdom Builder app for iOS has not been supported or updated in quite some time. Is the Android version still being supported and updated on a regular basis, or is it older as well? It's older. I honestly haven't looked into that, but it feels dated as far as some of the more modern app versions of games that are coming out. But it's, it's simple, and there's really not much to it. It's easy to play. 
I've just seen some comments on the iOS version that like as new versions of the iOS software come out that the app has had issues and they're not supporting mm. it anymore, but they're still it's still for sale and it's not a free app. It's one you pay for. So I even though I love Kingdom Builder, I have not purchased the iOS version app of it. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had any problems on Android. I, I was just counting and I have not counting companion apps. I have 19 different board game s- as apps on my phone. I have a lot. And some of my favorites, uh, Potion Explosion is great. Patchwork is awesome. Uh, Galaxy Trucker is a lot of fun. The new Race for the Galaxy app is really cool. That just came out fairly recently. Uh, San Juan, also good. Oniram is wonderful. I will never play the actual... This is an interesting point. I'll never play Oniram, the actual game, because holy cow, so much shuffling. I don't like shuffling (laughs) cards. And the app does all of it for you. And it's a solo game, so I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything by playing the app version of it. And they keep adding in the new expansions. So I'm basically always going to play Oniram as an app. Yeah, that's a great benefit of digital versions of games. Like games that have a lot of maintenance, you can play much easier on digital versions. And not just apps. Like I don't have a tablet and I don't really play board games on the phone. But I've played a couple of games online, like on Board Game Arena or... Yukata, there's there's different websites online where you can play board games as well. And I, I know, Cassidy, you said you play on a tablet. I don't actually own a tablet. I just own an iPhone. Admittedly, I do have the plus version of the iPhone, so it's a bigger screen. I would say that for most of the apps, you would probably have difficulty playing on a small iPhone. Mm-hmm. There are some exceptions. Like I think stuff like San Juan, there isn't much that's small and fiddly that you have to click on. You just have to be able to read text. And I think it, they do a pretty decent job of letting you zoom in on things. But stuff like Potion Explosion, you have to click on the individual marbles and there's no undo feature. So if you click on the wrong marble with your finger, you're stuck with it. And that kind of sucks. And that's even happened to me once or twice on my larger phone. On a tablet, I imagine you'd be golden. But mm. on a phone, I'd say generally, unless you have a large screen phone, most board game apps are going to be potentially problematic. I tried playing Takedo on my phone. <laughs> and this is the whole reason I upgraded my tablet. So my old tablet was too old to play Takedo. So I got it on my phone. And my phone was too small to really play Takedo. So I was like, well, I guess I'm upgrading my tablet now. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's awesome. terrible consumerism oh man I, I love just... it and Takedo <laughs> is a really awesome app I had the beta of it when it was in testing and I loved it and I got the full version and it's just as good so those are some games that are on and just have app versions but what about games that use an app as part of the gameplay like a companion app I haven't had a chance to play it yet since I just got my copy of Clank, but I'm kind of looking forward to the solo companion app for that, which I will be trying later tonight, probably. I have played a multiplayer game of Clank using the app and thought it was interesting. It, it wasn't, I, was, I don't know what I was expecting out of it, but it was a little bit more boring than I expected for a multiplayer game only because the three conditions that will trigger random events didn't change throughout the game and I guess that makes it easier to keep track of but like after we had gotten a random event based on one of them I was kind of expecting them to switch out but it was still cool and you don't have to have an app to play Clank that's important to note that not all companion apps are required and Clank is one of those it's just a fun little extra thing that you can do with it Mm -hmm. yeah last episode you mentioned playing where words at Dice Tower Con. We actually bought it and we've played it a few times since then. And that has an app that has the words and it tells you your roles, like when you wake up and look at the word. And the cool thing about having an app is there's so many words in the app and you, I think you can add your own words too. So it gives you a lot more choices than just a deck of cards for that. One thing that I don't like about the app that much is sometimes it like, if you're playing a lot in a row, it, the music gets tiring. I don't know if you can turn that off. <laughs> and then um, also, it's a little slow, like everyone waking up, and it gives you a lot of time to look at the word. But I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm bummed that they didn't use Eric Summer's voice for this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but... I want, yeah. I want more Eric Summer in my board game <laughs> apps, because he's the best. Mm-hmm. I've used a couple of not, well, they're companion apps, sort of, but they're not made by 
they're like fan made i guess Mm -hmm. so i mentioned before the scoring app for seven wonders that i use on for android that's that's made by yeah a fan and then i've used the an app on again on android to build a loyalty deck for bsg which saves me a giant crazy headache Mm -hmm. getting all that set up raise your hand if you've messed up a loyalty deck (laughs) on battlestar before yep that's me (laughs) Uh, I've heard multiple people have uh, accidentally done that in the past, and it makes for some very funny games of Battlestar when, like, <laughs> everyone's a Cylon. <laughs> but not exactly yeah. a true experience. Having three Cylons in a six-player game is kind of rough, just saying. <laughs> yeah. One of the new Escape Room series, the Unlock series of games, utilizes mm-hmm. an app um, to help give you hints and keep track of your time and all of that. Uh, Unlock is not my favorite of all of the Escape Room series, but it is fun. Yeah. And then there's other, like, it seems like a couple years ago when this first started happening, people were kind of skeptical about using an app alongside a board game. And I think publishers have really found a good way to incorporate apps into their games. And I do still have some concerns regarding future support I mean, but I I think I've heard um, Tom Vassell mentioned before on the Dice Tower that basically even if the app theoretically stops being supported and goes defunct, if the game is good enough, somebody online will create a tool that will take the place of the app. And I I do believe that that will be the case for really good games. So I don't have a lot of fear there, but there is a little bit just because I like the convenience of having an app on my phone made by the publisher to use with a game. And I'm very excited that I think this week my copy of First Martians is going to be arriving. Oh, I know. Everyone else already has their copies and I haven't even gotten my shipping notification yet. And I'm just, oh, I want it so much. I'm very excited about First Martians and it uses an app. So I'm hoping that it takes out a little bit of the fiddliness of Robinson Crusoe. But uh, even if it doesn't, I'm still going to love it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, like I replayed Robinson Crusoe more recently and it was so fiddly. (laughs) It's still great, but like there's so much upkeep. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there are a bunch of other games that we didn't even talk about, like One Night Ultimate Werewolf, Mansions of Madness, Second Edition, Alchemist, XCOM. There are a lot of games that utilize apps now. And I, for one, am a fan. I think that it generally makes all of the games that I've seen get apps. It has made the experience more seamless, less Mm -hmm. fiddly. And more thematic because they often add in uh, elements such as music or other things to help set the mood. And I think that that's great. I was actually just going to say that I think most of the games that have companion apps that are required for gameplay are already thematic games. So adding Mm. an app into it does really, I think it would help with the immersion. I actually haven't played, well, I played Fuse, but I haven't played any other game that actually requires the app to play the game Mm -hmm. because I'm not really a thematic player. So I personally, even though I will sometimes have my phone at the table because I'm a horrible, horrible person, I don't really like electronics at the table. For me, it's nice to have something to help me with scoring and with setting up the game and things like that. But I don't really personally care for a required app in for a gameplay. I would definitely, if you have the opportunity at some point, I would suggest that you give Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition a try. I think it is one of the best companion apps that I've seen, especially because it was the second edition of the game. The first edition of Mansions of Madness suffered from fiddliness to the extreme, and if you set things up improperly in during game setup, which was easy to do, it could ruin the experience. And the app takes care of all of that, and it's really easy. So if you have a chance at some point, I would suggest giving it a try because I think it's one of the best. But I didn't like Mansions of Madness. <laughs> so uh, I mean, yeah. I it, it shows up in game nights and I might, if they need another player, try it. But it's not something that I'm going to seek out because I just didn't enjoy the original. And not because it was fiddly because Lord knows I play enough fiddly games. <laughs> it's just I did, the theme just didn't. Not a, you're not a anything. not a Cthulhu gal. <laughs> no. Ambie and I got to play Mansions of Madness yeah. together at Dice Tower Con, so that was yeah, fun. Yeah, that was fun. Although I think we played a rule wrong and died. Yes, we did. <laughs> but it was so fun. It was fun. 
All right, so in our Board Game Geek Guild or on Twitter, tweet at us or post what your favorite board games with apps are or how you think this trend will change or evolve as time passes. We'd love to hear your thoughts on where you think the future of board games and apps uh, in a relationship is going. I'm shipping board games and apps, for the record. For today's etymology segment, I'm going to look at the origins of the word play in its verb form. How have I not done play already? Uh, Really? I'm looking back through all my old episodes. Nope, I haven't done it yet. So play comes from the Old English plegan, meaning move rapidly, occupy or busy oneself, exercise, frolic, make sport of, mock, or perform music. That word, plegan, was taken from a word of the same spelling in West Germanic and Old Saxon, which meant occupy oneself about, and vouch for or take charge of, respectively. If you trace the roots back further, you find the Old Frisian word, plega, meaning tend to. The Middle Dutch word playen, meaning to rejoice or be glad, and the German flagen, meaning take care of or cultivate. The definition of play, stating to take part in a game, originated in the 1200s and became the antonym to the word work in the late 14th century. The phrase play fair didn't come into use until the mid 15th century. Looking at how it has been utilized and modified in other languages throughout history, play and the words given for play in various cultures have been used to describe, amongst other aspects, movement, insignificance, comparison and the divine, playful attention, contest, recreation, laughing and mocking, play as a whole, rhythmic movement, swinging and waving about, ceremony and care, and battle. I'd bet that most board gamers have encountered pretty much all of those things to some degree in the games that we play, so the very definitions of play seem fitting. And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, boardgameblitz.com, to get links to all our social media pages, including our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Board Game Geek Guild. If you're enjoying the podcast and want to show us a little love, you can become a patron for as little as $1 a month. Just head to patreon.com slash boardgameblitz. Our patrons get a lot of benefits, including access to our private Slack channel where you can chat with us directly anytime. Our theme song was composed by Andrew Morrow, technical support provided by Toby Mao. Board Game Blitz is a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Check out the other shows in the network by visiting dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, Domo Arigato Blitzer Roboto. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. how much I enjoyed on earth at Gen Con. So I promised that I would talk about it this yep, episode. Yep, 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 ah, yep. Origins. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I always do that. They're basically <coughs> the same thing. Other players to reclaim lost ruins and build wonders. Wonders. Oh, needers. <laughs> things. You're building things. Yeah, that, that's a great... Um... Oh, I can't remember the word. <laughs> Good thing. What's that word? <laughs> like, benefit? Ben- yes, benefit. Yes. <laughs> oh <my God>. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> Stop making me laugh. It makes me cough. <coughs>